Welcome to the Power and Market Report. I'm Albert Liu. I'm very happy to be joined once again by Doug Casey. He's the founder of Casey Research, frequent guest on the show, a good friend of mine and a mentor. He joins us today from Uruguay. Doug, thank you very much for coming back on the Power and Market Report. How are you? Well, it's always enjoyable having a conversation with you, Albert, and I look forward to that in person when I guess I'll see you at the Sprott Conference in Vancouver in uh, July, huh? That's exactly correct. Doug uh, is going to be a featured speaker at our conference. That's the end of July, July 25th. And uh, please, uh, if you're interested in coming, check out uh, details at sprottconference.com. You can find out how to register and join us with James Rickards, David Stockman, Rick Rule, and of course, Doug Casey and a host of other great speakers. Uh, Doug, I want to mention before we start that uh, you and John Hunt uh, are in the process, maybe weeks away from launching your second fiction book together. Can you tell us about that? Yes, this is the second in a septet, seven books, uh, tracking the history of our hero, Charles Knight, as he advances into increasingly politically incorrect occupations and reforms their unjustly besmirched reputations. Uh, here in book two, Drug Lord, uh, Charles, uh, having had uh, a couple hundred million dollars stolen from him by the U.S. government, wants to get that money back. So he be gets into the drug business, both legal and illegal. And what happens from that? And uh, this is not a usual tale uh, about the drug business. I think it's, it's, it's unique and uh, got a lot of crazy elements in it realistic but crazy elements so the uh, book is going to be launched uh, at freedom fest in july uh, in the u.s and then uh mirably dictu at the sprout conference in canada where i'll see you will be the canadian launch of it absolutely and i just received my copy my pre-launch copy which i can't wait to get into the first one was just uh i just couldn't put it down so i'm, I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, you talk about <laughs> unjustly besmirched occupations. Was there any order in which you and John decided to introduce these? Are these from the sort of the least besmirched to the most besmirched? <laughs> Is that how you decided to, uh, to introduce these topics? Yeah, basically, that's correct. Because the, the way this, the, the way that uh, my collaboration with John worked out is that uh, I recognize, I know my limitations. And uh, I'm kind of lazy, not as well disciplined as I'd like to be. So uh, Jeffrey Tucker put us together, and uh, John is a uh, an MD and a professor at the University of Virginia who doesn't want to practice medicine anymore, uh, really. Uh, most, many, many doctors don't want to practice medicine anymore for a lot of reasons in the United States. So we worked on these together, and I'd already roughed out the idea of six and then seven novels, taking Charles from being a speculator, uh, where he where he starts out to something more radical, drug lord. Uh, and then uh, after this book, he becomes an assassin, which is more radical. And we explore how it's done and the morality of it and so forth. And then after that, that'll be out next year, and then two years from now, uh, he will uh, he will become a terrorist, because I have a lot of theories and thoughts on terrorism as a method of warfare. It's also unjustly besmirched, incidentally. And then he goes back to Africa, where he becomes a warlord, and everybody's supposed to hate warlords, but we show you can be a good guy as a warlord. And then he becomes the Antichrist, which is where I get to do my thing on religion. Uh, people will love that. People either love or hate all these books, incidentally. They're, they're like a philosophical litmus test. And then in the last book, the seventh book, um, uh, we explore World War III and what it looks like. So anyway, yeah, increasingly radical as time goes on. <laughs> That's great. And, you know, on your point about being lazy, Doug, if human beings weren't intrinsically lazy to some degree, 
uh, we never would have invented all of these time and labor saving machines. So that's actually an evolutionary trait that's quite good, wouldn't you say? Uh, that's a very good observation, uh, Albert. You're, you're quite correct, actually. Uh, <clears throat> that's right, because it's a, it's a pro-survival characteristic to conserve enemy, uh, to conserve energy. You know, that's why, you know, cats and dogs sleep most of the day and just go out and hunt briefly. And uh, all animals do that and humans, too. So, uh, yes, uh, uh, labor saving devices are pro survival and saving energy is pro survival. So you're, you're quite right. So being lazy is actually not such a bad thing. It isn't unless you fall into the uh, Bastiat trap of uh, stealing rather than earning <laughs> is what, what the way he described it. Yes, either that or indirectly stealing by going on welfare or, you know, taking unearned goods from the state. Right. Uh, which is disguised theft, actually. So uh, there's a question that I thought to ask you just the other day as we were setting up this call, Doug. Um, and, and it was after I had read this article that you recently, or an interview that you did uh, in Casey Research, uh, I think I finally determined what it is that I'm striving for in my career. And it took some, some time to crystallize this, but looking back at my activities over the past decade, I think my goal, career-wise, my ultimate goal is to find an occupation or a pastime that I enjoy so much and that I'm so good at that the productive activity becomes almost effortless. I think that's the goal. It has nothing to do with prestige or money, although those are both welcomed outcomes. It's not, it's not the goal. Uh, and when I look at your career, at least what you're doing now, you've, been doing, you've done many things in your life. But, but now, when I was reading that article, I was thinking, you know, Doug Casey is a guy who the market pays for being himself. And being yourself has got to be the, the thing that you're obviously the best at, that, better than anyone else. And if you're a healthy person, it's got to be one of the most enjoyable things to do. So I, I want to know if, if you ever made that your goal, because you, you've done so many things in your career from uh, you know, being a stockbroker to an investor to now a fiction author. You imported exotic cars for a while. Did you ever have a career goal during all of that time? Hmm. You know, Albert, I actually never did. It's very strange. I, um, when I came to a fork in the road, I would take it. But, you know, the strange thing about life that I found is, is that if you turn left instead of right at the fork, it can be an arbitrary choice, your whole life changes and you can live in an alternate reality. So, um, I've always had interests in certain things, and I'm drawn towards things that are interesting. Uh, but uh, no, I haven't uh, driven in any one particular direction. And the main things that I'm sorry about, quite frankly, are not things that I have done. Uh, regrets, I have a few, uh, as Frank Sinatra said, but then again, too few to mention. Uh, what I really regret is things that I could have done that I didn't do. So uh, it's that path not taken. But, uh, you know, on the whole, uh, what I'm, uh, the only thing I'm really unhappy about is cosmic realities. The fact that the second law of thermodynamics dictates that all systems wind down without significant outside inputs of energy, that is to say. And that's something we all fight against. Like my knees are shot, and I don't want to replace them because I'm hoping that stem cells will, you know, be be a magic solution for me and so forth. But uh, no, uh, no regrets, generally speaking. Can you talk about, or can you think of times where you've, in your career, you've accepted uh, a job that that you really didn't like, and you accepted it for the wrong reasons? Hmm. Well, you know, the fact is that since I, um, when I got out of college, which was a misallocation 
four years of time and a lot of money, but let's forget about that. Um, what jobs did I have that I didn't want to do? Well, um, hmm. I actually. That's a good thing, Doug, <laughs> that you can't I, think I've of one. Always, Albert, I've always been self employed, to tell you the truth. I really have. Uh, I worked for an insurance company for a while on a salary. Uh, that was a second job. I was a, I was a bartender and a waiter at night in a nightclub in Washington, D.C. So I was working two jobs. And, uh, but, you know, after an initial period, I was uh, strictly on commission. So I've never actually been employed. In fact, I would describe myself as a hardcore unemployable. And when people say, well, we've got to get jobs for people, jobs, it's all about jobs. I need a job. I, I, I don't even understand that way of thinking. Uh, I've never needed or wanted a job. It means you're reliant upon somebody else to give you a job. And I find that a degrading concept, uh, degrading outlook. So no, I've never done anything I didn't want to do. That's a great answer. Okay, let's, um, let's move to the article because the article is going to be a nice uh, introduction to another topic that uh, you and I want to discuss. And that is sort of the, um, I guess, the political leanings of our Silicon Valley champions. Uh, the article I'm referring to is an interview you did on Casey Research. And you were talking about uh, the universal basic income. Um, I, I think uh, it was uh, the discussion was stimulated by something Mark Zuckerberg had said. So can you introduce that piece? The idea is there. Uh, yeah, a lot of these people like Zuckerberg, uh, you know, who's, who's just a guy that, uh, you know, apparently stole an idea and he's a good businessman and he's made a lot of money. Okay, great. Uh, good for him. But uh, he's saying that, um, quite correctly, that robots and artificial intelligence and uh, things of this nature are going to unemploy most people in the world today. Truck drivers, dead ducks, taxi drivers, they're going away. Factory workers won't need them. So what are all these people going to do? Um, and it's, it's really rather stupid to, to ask that question because this is exactly what happened during the first industrial revolution when you know, 90 to 95 percent of all people were working in the fields 12 hours a day, seven days a week or six days a week anyway. Uh, when the machines came in uh, and, and, and made and, and were able to produce much more food, much with much less labor, those people were all unemployed. Uh, so what Zuckerberg and these idiots want to do is give them all a guaranteed income called the UBI, Universal Basic Income. And it's a really stupid concept, a destructive concept. And they, and they talk about, we need it. No, we don't need it. And they act as if it hasn't been tried. I mean, generations of blacks in the US have been destroyed and cemented to the bottom of society by like a universal basic income for black people. It's called welfare. Oh, and the same thing with the whites in Appalachia have been destroyed by this. And Europeans are being destroyed by that. I mean, the, these European governments give you an, a welfare whether you work or not. So it's, it's a really stupid and unnecessary idea. But they're promoting it. And people are saying, oh, it must be like a necessary stroke of genius. Uh, so it's, a, it's just amazing to me. But you, you know what Einstein said? He said, after hydrogen... The most common thing in the universe is stupidity. <laughs> I love that quote. Um, it's a great quote. <laughs> it's, it's very good. He, someone might have to revise it pretty soon, the way things are going, though. I, I think <laughs> stupidity is catching up. Um, <laughs> I, I had the same discussion. <laughs> Sorry, Doug, I didn't hear that last bit. Uh, yeah, more, more common than hydrogen. Yeah, it's, it is amazing to think of, actually. 
Um, I had the same discussion a while back with uh, Dr. Mark Thornton of the Mises Institute, and this is when I think it was Switzerland had the referendum on the same topic. And uh, I was, I, I sort of took the other side, and, and of course it depends how the thing is implemented, but if you're going to talk about universal basic incomes, as you correctly pointed out, we already have something like this in a different form, meaning through welfare and other transfer payments. It's not like people actually go down to zero income if they don't work. Uh, it, it seems rare, if at all, that that actually happens. Uh, and I think I can think of several different varieties of socialism that would be more favorable to the one we have right now. And I, I'm thinking that universal basic income would be one of them if it was implemented uh, in a certain way that uh, disemployed all of these government workers that are involved in the business of domestic welfare. If it got rid of all of that, uh, that would be a tremendous savings and a, a tremendous reduction in disincentives to work. And uh, at the same time, you wouldn't really be actually doling out more welfare than you, than you actually are now. Uh, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Ah, that's, uh, I think that's an astute observation, and it's correct. Uh, sure, uh, you're getting rid of all those useless mouths working for the government. Of course, then they'd become useless mouths relying on a universal basic income but it wouldn't be as much as they're earning now and they wouldn't find other ways to destroy things and and uh, corrupt things and i suppose yeah but these are all tech see yeah i agree with you but problem is that's a technical solution and i don't think we ought to talk about uh, technical answers to the question. These are actually moral and philosophical questions. It's a question of what's right and wrong. So that's the way I look at it. But yeah, if if you want to look at it on a on a technocratic basis, no, you're quite correct. None of these government employees, they're all supernumeraries. They can all be dispensed with. Yeah, I think that there is one moral advantage to uh, having the basic income rather than uh, the domestic welfare state is that is that uh, it would, if if not fully, it would it eliminate partially the notion that these people who who perform these functions are necessary. Uh, so you would still have the state dependence, but you wouldn't have uh, the uh, the notion that that bureaucrats are necessary to carry out this function. Uh, that's an excellent point, actually. Yes, it is. Um, um, I, I agree. But, you know, as the economy collapses this next time, as we go back into the financial hurricane, which started in 2007, and it's been a very big eye of the storm, as we go into the trailing edge, which, which is happening now, I believe, um, you know, these governments are all going to go bankrupt. And I think they're going to have to make radical changes hopefully including firing a bunch of these people just because they can't afford to pay them and, and cutting welfare because they can't afford to pay it and so forth. And more people are going to try to collect on welfare too. So it's going to be very interesting to watch what's uh, happening. <clears throat> this is one of the reasons, incidentally, why I think that the Orient, Asia, will continue rising because uh, I don't think that there's any country in the Far East that has a real welfare system. Am I correct uh, or am I missing something? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not something that I think I'm qualified to, to uh, inform on. Uh, but certainly if you want to look at, you know, averages, status quo, there there's, seems to be a definite difference uh, between the West and the East in that, in that regard. Yeah, I think that the East is... Uh, has much, much less of it than there is in the West. And this is one of the reasons why they're, you know, gaining so rapidly. So for what it's worth. Okay. There was a, the other topic that we discussed that was related to this. And that is, why does it seem like so many of these leaders, and we're talking about Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, uh, particularly people 
you know, involved in Silicon Valley and technology. Why is it that they seem to be championing these causes? Uh, you want to take a guess at, at why might, that might be? Uh, yeah. Uh, one reason is that these guys, because their technologies are so powerful, uh, they've gotten hooked up with the state. Uh, they've glommed onto the state. The state has cozied up to them, and they've cozied back to the state. So uh, they've come to like the idea of the state because in their position, as some of the richest and most powerful men in the world, you know, they've made the state their friend. So I think that that's one reason. I think another reason is that um, as powerful as they are, uh, they expect that they'll be insulated from any negative consequences of this, and they don't want to see uh, the the plebeians, the hoi polloi, the capita kensi, you know, revolt. So they want to throw them some bread and circuses. Uh -huh. That's another reason. And I think a third reason might be that uh, these guys are technocrats, and they see uh, like high-tech solutions to every problem. I don't think they, their brains are not wired to look at these things in terms of right and wrong and morality and uh, philosophical concepts. They look at it from a strictly technocratic point of view. Not that they're wrong. I mean, there are a lot of techno technocratic solutions to problems, but it's not the first place you look. So, um, but I'm disappointed because in the old days, 20, 30 years ago, um, it used to be that Silicon Valley and the computer guys it was a hotbed of libertarianism, even radical libertarianism. But that's all changed as it's gotten bigger and richer and more bureaucratic. So uh, I never cease to be disappointed with my fellow humans. You probably feel the same way. Uh, you know, I do, and that that last part is a, is an angle that I hadn't thought of. The other ones are, are I guess I concur. Um, there's a few other observations I can add to that. One is not just specific to technology. It's it's uh, seems to afflict uh, many people who have experienced spe spectacular success, and that is just guilt, uh, just plain guilt. Which, which is what mm -hmm. encourages them to try to find solutions that uh, is sort of they're ill-equipped to, to uh, or the problems of which they're ill-equipped to handle. What do you think about that, the guilt factor? I think that's an excellent observation. Yes. question is, why do they feel guilty? Is it a product of their education uh, that's been kind of crammed down their throats? You should feel guilty for, you know, the socialist education type of thing. Or... Uh, perhaps they've uh, personally committed, you know, wrong acts in their lives that they feel like they need to atone for. Uh, maybe we all have. Uh, I, I don't know. But, uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think that's an element, too. But guilt is something that I think we ought to try to expunge from our lives and not take out our guilt on society at large. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. Uh, the other factor uh, or motivation is not necessarily a bad one. It's, in fact, it's a good one. It's just the basic philanthropic instincts that humans have once they satisfy their basic needs or even the beyond basic needs. Someone with spectacular wealth really needs to find other ways to, uh, to you know, fulfill and enjoy themselves. So this is actually a good thing. Do you agree with that? Uh not really. Uh, and okay. I'll tell you why. Because if you really want to be a philanthropist and you really want to help your fellow man, you don't do stupid things like what Buffett and Gates are doing, which is give their fortunes away. I mean, just, you know, throw alms to the poor. All that does is dissipate that pool of capital and further help cement the poor to the bottom of society by giving them free stuff. If you really want to help your fellow humans, you ought to do what you're doing to continue to compound wealth. So there's more wealth in the world, you know, that'll benefit everybody. So actually I'm opposed to philanthropy in anything like its present form for many reasons. I mean, I, it's, um, you know. 
I think you slightly misunderstood what I was saying because I actually agree with you. Uh, but what I was trying to say was that the motive, not that the, that the acts are, are fruitful and beneficial, but the motive uh, is philanthropic in its true sense, meaning trying to help uh, even if the means by which they pursue uh, those ends are, are actually destructive. Ah, yes, that's a different question. You're quite correct. Um, yes, and I, I certainly applaud that feeling of wanting to help other humans. Uh, it's just too bad that they're, um, they're going about it in such a way as that it is doing the opposite of what I'm sure they want to do. It's perverse. Yeah, and so and so here's the final uh, part of the discussion, which maybe I can add some insight uh, to is, is why do so many of these tech leaders end up uh, falling into this trap? And my thoughts on it are are like this. People who end up leading technologies, they come from the rank and file of engineers and technologists. And so if you have to look back and, and see who these people are, and what their experiences have been up until that point. And, you know, I've worked in the field, so I've known a lot of these people, and I've grown up in that environment myself. Uh, these people tend to be uh, pretty bright, uh, especially when it comes to the more analytical side of things. Uh, they've done well all their lives uh, through their formal education. People all their lives have been telling them how smart they are. Uh, they end up getting, you know, high paying jobs. The ones that rise to leadership obviously have done well in the corporate ranks as well. So these people have for their entire lives have been being told by the market and by their peers and other people just how smart they are. And of course, like any other specialist, uh, they've spent all of their time thinking about the things that they work on and very little time thinking about other things such as economics in this case. And they also have a, an idea that they can solve any other problem. It's a, kind of like a Superman syndrome. So it doesn't surprise me one bit that uh, th th these types of people would fall into the most simple traps, thought traps, of thinking that you can solve problems like poverty uh, the way that they're doing without, without any clue about how economies really work. Hmm. I think you're quite correct. It's a good observation in my opinion. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it, it doesn't surprise me uh, at all, and it, it would, not just in technology, but it, it, talk about any other profession where you have sort of, you know, very smart people, very specialized. Uh, doctors is probably, uh, you know, another, uh, another field where you would find this same phenomenon. Um, you've probably run across a lot of people like this, not just in technology, but in other areas, in the circles that you run in. Uh, ha have you noticed a pattern? Um, because the one thing that you said earlier in this discussion kind of surprised me, and that is that, that uh, the Silicon Valley used to be a hotbed of libertarianism. What are the hotbeds of libertarianism now? It doesn't seem to be coming out of these, these areas. Hmm. Are there any hotbeds of libertarianism, uh, actually? Uh, good question. Uh, I can't think of any, but uh, I can tell you that when I was in my 20s, there weren't any, there were, in college, and when I was in my 20s, and all, there weren't any libertarians. I mean, we were literally as scarce as hen's teeth. I mean, we were rare, rare, rare. Um, yeah, of course, there were people that um, had libertarian inclinations. I mean, you know, good-hearted people, but they didn't have the, you know, they, they didn't have the intellectual basics down. They weren't reading libertarian books. Uh, so there are a lot more of us out there today, although we still aren't even a rounding error. But I don't know where you go to find libertarians, quite frankly. Uh, well, you can go to like the Sprott Conference. I think there's, you know, more than, you know, more than usual there. Or certainly you can go to the Freedom Fest uh, in Las Vegas, which occurs the week before Sprott. That's right, uh, and that's that's where you're. Is that where uh, you will be next in the U.S.? Because you did a little a bit of a head fake. I noticed that you were in Seattle uh, earlier this year, so I thought that was Casey's comet coming back to the northern hemisphere. But now you're back down in South America. 
I'm spending more and more time uh, down here in South America and less time uh, in the U.S. Uh, but yeah, the first thing I'm going to do when I come back to the States, uh, and I get later than usual coming back to the States every year, uh, I'm going to spend a week in Vegas for Freedom Fest, and also because I like to play poker, and I like to do some of the other things you can do in Vegas. And then I'm going to go from there directly up to Vancouver for Sprott, and then go back to Aspen, where I'll spend the rest of the summer, and then back down here. Sounds like a great plan. Okay, so I'll remind everyone, uh, the book will launch at Freedom Fest, uh, and then uh, Doug will also be at uh, the Vancouver conference at SprottConference.com. Uh, if you want to come meet Doug, uh, buy a book, and get it signed by Doug. We'd love to see you. Uh, Doug, once again, thank you very much. Always love speaking with you, and I'm looking forward to seeing you in Vancouver. Pleasure is mutual, Albert. See you then.